and welcome. Uh, so I need to just say we're having a little bit of technical difficulties for everyone here. So here in person, uh, our speakers aren't working. So we're going, we're going to speak loud, all right, so you can hear us and project. Uh, but the other thing is, for you guys online, we are speaking loud and projecting, and you can hear us through the system okay. So we apologize for the technical difficulties. Just know, uh, sometimes that happens. As we uh, look at beginning our worship together, we want to give you an opportunity to learn more about what's going on at St. Michael. And so that opportunity is a congregational meeting that we have coming uh, next Sunday at 6 p.m. You can make it here in person or you can watch the live stream. We'll give a little bit of a heads up on what, where the call committee is at, as well as just some other um, things that are happening in the congregation. And we'd love to have you here for that. Uh, as we begin this morning, Pastor Sam is going to talk about the theme of the day. We also want to welcome today, and you'll see them come forward, uh, representatives from Camp Luther Haven, uh, Tim Jank, director, and Keith Peters, <laughs> summer ministries director, will be participating in our worship. Today we turn uh, to Thomas. Every Christian doubts God's promises at times, the disciple Thomas doubted, yet stayed faithful as he searched for certainty. We are strengthened by his example. So let's stand and begin worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ has risen from the dead. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Living God, in the light of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we rejoice to see in faith our Lord Jesus, by whose wounds we are healed. Trusting in your promise of mercy, we repent of our sins, the sins for which Jesus suffered and died. Forgive our quickness to turn from you, our slowness of heart to believe, our reluctance to walk with Jesus in the new life of Easter. 
Renew us in your grace, we pray, and guide us in the way of truth and eternal life. Amen. In great mercy, God raised Jesus from the dead as a sign of his sacrifice for our sins and was, and was completed and accepted. By this, our Heavenly Father has given us new birth into a living hope from the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In obedience to our Lord's command and in the confidence of Christ's resurrection, I assure you of God's complete forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus from the dead, you assured us of your forgiving love and his victory over sin, Satan, and death. We pray that you increase our faith and trust in you and his work so that we may live the new life to which you have called us. Amen. I now invite up, well, please be seated as we enter into our time of our children's message. And I'm going to now invite up Keith Peters. Good morning. I want to do a little exercise with you this morning. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the game Simon Says? Everyone know how to play? It's a pretty simple game, right? Whenever the leader says, Simon Says, before whatever they say, you would do it. However, if I don't say Simon Says, the goal is not to do it. So if I said, Simon Says, raise your right hand, yeah, everyone would do that, right? Simon says, put your right hand down. Good. Raise your left hand. Now, notice how it's very easy sometimes when the leader does what you're not supposed to do to follow them, even though I didn't say Simon says, right? That's a little trick for a leader to do. And what it teaches us, the game Simon says, is that people naturally do what they see not so much what we hear, at least for some of us. I want, uh, and that's true for our friend Thomas in the gospel that you're going to hear today. The lesson we're going to hear, Thomas, he thought he saw Jesus defeated on a cross. And he couldn't believe what the disciples were telling him that Jesus had been raised from the dead. He believed his eyes, what I see, over what I'm hearing. And uh, that can be true for us, too. I want to show you something. I have two tennis balls here. Now, you might look at these and go, yeah, those look like ordinary tennis balls. And you'd be pretty much right. They were originally created to be ordinary tennis balls. This one is ordinary, as you can see, right? But this one, there's something different about it. Uh, now, some of you might just take me at my word and go, okay, I trust you that there's something different about it. It's heavier. That's what's different about it. Uh, but some of us, maybe like Thomas, want a little more proof. So if I tried to bounce this in front of you, 
then you would probably know either by the not being able to get it back up to my hand or the big thud that you might have heard, right? Uh, like this tennis ball and its heaviness and the thing that we can't see, sometimes like Thomas and what he can't see, we often need a little bit more of something to believe in things. And the thing that I think is really profound about what the Bible tells us is the Bible tells us that faith is believing in what we can't see. And for Scripture to be something that we believe in, for God's Word to be something that we believe in, the Holy Spirit comes in and gives us faith in what we can't always see. We need that helper sometimes to do that. Jesus' words to Thomas when he does appear, he says, Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. See, even though sometimes we might feel defeated like Thomas, what the Bible really tells us is that Jesus' death was not a defeat, it's a victory. And we can have faith that that's true. Pray with me and then Tim's going to come up. God, we pray that you would give us faith in your word and faith that you are who you say you are and that you have risen from the dead. And God, help us uh, see you for who you really are. Amen. Good morning again, everyone. My name again is Tim from Camp Luther Haven, and it is great to be here with you this morning. Um, I was looking back at my calendar and noticed that last year I was all signed up to come and do Luther Haven Sunday here, and uh, then COVID came around and everything canceled. So we missed out last year in joining you for Luther Haven Sunday. And uh, so it, it really is just great to be among you uh, and in a church where we can be together. So I uh, appreciate that, but also, as many of you, we each have a story from this last year, don't we? Of uh, just how COVID's impacted our lives and how we've been resilient, how we've been strong, places that it's affected us. As you can imagine, as a ministry like St. Michael's, Camp Luther Haven was also very affected uh, by COVID-19. Last year, we were hoping for the best and uh, working towards summer. Uh, it turned out we were only able to have three weeks of summer, uh, so we lost, we, we weren't able to have uh, over a thousand campers that we normally had, and that was very disheartening, very sad for us because of the impact that we know camp has on so many. And so it's just so exciting to be not only here, but also be planning for another summer of Camp Luther Haven. We know it's going to look a little different, but as things uh, continue to look a little better here in Indiana, we're hopeful that it's going to look more like normal. Uh, than it has been, so we're very excited about that. We have over 700 campers already signed up, and uh, so that's a really good sign as well. Uh, this last year, uh, we've, we were talking a lot about True North, about God as our focus, and uh, we've kind of held with that, and many of you have come alongside us, and St. Michael's has uh, partnered with Camp Luther Haven, and so just want to give you a big thank you for doing that in a year that had a lot of uncertainty both in your life and also St. Michael's. And uh, even yet, uh, you came alongside Luther Haven. So we so much are grateful for that and uh, look forward to getting back to things uh, and being able to connect uh, with each other and with a lot of kids this year. Uh, we have a table out in the back, and so Keith and I are going to be back there and maybe Bethany uh, or Celine, who's here as well. And I would love to talk to you more about camp and the programs we offer. We have uh, programs from kindergarten all the way up through high school, one day up to six day camps, and I really try to match uh, ages and appropriateness uh, with all kinds of things at Luther Haven. Uh, we have a lot of fun at camp, but it's also a great place to grow in your faith, and so look forward to that as well. We'd love to talk to you, so if you have questions or want to tell us a little bit more about your Luther Haven story, I know many of you have been out there before, uh, please come see us. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, it is a blessing to, to be a part of the ministry that happens out at Luther Haven. It's also a, a blessing to hear how kids from camp get connected to Jesus' word, just like it is a blessing to hear our eighth graders and how they are connected into God's word. And so today we're going to hear from Emma Stir, 
uh, one of our 28 uh, eighth grade confirmants. And uh, Emma, I'm sorry, we're going to have to ask you to speak loudly for us. Thank you. Hello, my name is Emma Sturr. I am currently in eighth grade attending Emmanuel St. Michael. My parents are Amy and Joshua Sturr. I have five siblings and three dogs. One thing that you might not know about me is that I have a twin. My confirmation verse is Isaiah 43, verse 1. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. The words that stick out to me the most are the words fear not. The words fear not are used in the Bible 365 times, one time for every day of the year. I have been blessed that I don't have to that I don't have more than the basic fears, but this verse still applies to my life. Fear is a part of our daily lives. It can range from small things to big things, but I know no matter what, how big or small our fears are, I know that from Isaiah 43 verse one, that we do not have to fear because God is there for us. We know that he is there for us because he decided to choose us and call us by name, and that in the end we will be with him in heaven because God sent Jesus for us. Overall, I can apply this to my daily life by not letting fear take control. Instead, I should remember that God is there for me and he will help me through it. I can also help other people know that whatever they have fears over, God is there for them. Thank you, Emma, for sharing and for speaking well so we could hear you. That was uh, a blessing. And now we invite up uh, Tim Jenk again, who's going to do our readings for us. And they all revolve around uh, pointing us to a risen Jesus. Our first reading is from Job uh, 19, chapter 23. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the word of the Lord.
I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel, if you're able. The gospel reading is from St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by, leaving, by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. We continue our series in this Easter season of those who are encountering the risen Jesus. Easter is a supreme season of faith. Those who saw our resurrected Lord after experiencing or hearing about the empty tomb, as they saw him alive, it was an experience that guided them for the rest of their life. And Easter, our celebration here, for instance, is a high point of our faith with all of the music, the orchestra, the lilies that are still out there with the cross, with all of the good news that 
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. It is a time of high point for our faith. And then I wonder, how does that square with the fact that the church, in its regular, what we call lectionary, a series, three-year series of lessons that are read on appointed Sundays, that in all three years, they include this account of Thomas. Thomas, the one that we sometimes call doubting Thomas because of his doubt, of course. But if we pay close attention to how he acted with his doubt, we can learn from it. So we're looking at Thomas, faithful doubter. Now, you could take that to mean he could always be counted on to doubt. I'm using it in a different way. He's a doubter who still remained faithful. Thomas was called the twin by his companions. Certainly, probably for the uh, obvious reason that a sister or brother was um, born at the same time as he, but over the years, it has also come to mean that he was double-minded, so to speak, believing and yet disbelieving. There are other instances of this in the New Testament. For instance, in Mark chapter 9, Jesus encounters a father who comes to him and says, please come, heal my son, What's for because, because he has a demon and it gives him severe seizures, often throws him into the fire, and so on. And in Mark chapter 9, I'll begin at verse 21, Jesus says to the Father, How long has he had this? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Thomas was another one of those unbelieving believers. Doubt and faith often coexist in our hearts. It's a part of who we are as we, born in sin, have that tendency always to ask, to question, to put ourselves in the center. On the one hand, the message of Easter, the message of a risen Lord, wants to help us reach out and grasp those blessings that he gives. And yet there's something that holds us back, a wish that if that's the case, I wish this or that would turn out differently. I wish I would know what the outcome will be of the diagnosis I just had and that it will be favorable. I wish that COVID-19 over this last year that has so interrupted our lives would soon be gone. I wish I had a promise of that. This natural ambiguity in our lives and in our hearts is a part of that human that we are. At one and the same time, we recognize that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And yet, if he's alive, yes, he's alive, but will he? Will he work things in my life the way I want them to? Well, so often, when we have those doubts, Either we try just not to think about them or at least to hide them from others, but Thomas gives us courage to express our doubts as we wrestle with God. Thomas had to have courage to step up in the group of his now left 10 disciples, his 10 companions who had been with Jesus over those three years, not even his having seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, not long before the events of Holy Week and Easter, could give him the assurance that 
this Lord, his Lord, the one who he had come to know and love, had risen from the dead. When those times come, and we wonder, does anyone know my doubts? (laughs) Thomas gives us the courage simply to blurt them out and to ask those questions. And in fact, expressing our doubts, understanding them, taking them, and taking them to our Lord helps us grow and mature in faith over and over again as doubts come. When we leave them in the hands of our Lord and ask about them, we receive his blessing. Think of another set of twins, Old Testament, Esau and Jacob. Remember, later, Jacob wanted a blessing from the angel of the Lord at the brook Jabbok. If you were present at any of former Pastor Lessing's uh, Bible studies, you knew that in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord was Jesus himself, pre-incarnate. Jacob wanted a blessing before he met his brother Esau, and he wrestled with that angel all night. Finally, as dawn approached, he limped, but he got his blessing. He expressed it. Our expressing those doubts is a way of penetrating to the very heart of our Lord himself. So Thomas helps us face our doubts and discover what we what we receive from our Lord. But he does something else. Thomas helps us face our doubts in the presence of Christ and his followers. Over my ministry, I've often seen that someone's sudden not attending worship or dropping away from Bible class is a sign of doubt And it's that tendency we have when we think, well, everybody else in the church is so certain. Or I've heard these scriptures before, but they aren't meaning anything. The tendency is just to drop out. Thomas says, That's just the time to come to the witness, the witness certainly of the word that was written so long ago, the witness also of the saints, as we would call them, down through the ages, down to our modern day when we pick up a portals of prayer or a devotional book written by someone who has encountered that Lord in the word. But we so often withdraw. When Jesus first appeared to those disciples, without Thomas there, we don't know why he wasn't what had interfered, but when he appeared, he said to them, peace be with you. And he breathed on them and gave them the Holy Spirit, bringing them back into his fold as his disciples after every one of them had left him. Thomas wasn't there, of course. When he rejoined the apostles, that he found a group that testified to that resurrection, but he found he could not believe. But, did you notice, rather than allowing that to separate himself from the disciples, the next week he was there when our Lord came. Thomas is no skeptic, putting his hands over his eyes and cursing the dark or sticking his fingers in his ears and mourning the silence. He does not defy God. He had experienced the loss of the presence of Christ, and it was painful. We recognize in him that fearful moment when a person feels he's alone without God. His words are a prayer, though, that God would come help not a flag of rebellion. So Thomas wasn't seeking some kind of answer to a clever riddle about God, such as, well, could he make a stone so heavy that he himself could not pick it up? No. 
Thomas was seeking a person, the living Christ, as the answer to his soul's hunger and need. Christ was alive. Thomas, we, Thomas and we want to know that we, what we dare for, hope for in the darkness of our human existence and questioning. Faith is about God's relationship to us rather than somehow answering intellectual questions. When we're involved then about our relationship to God and we seek his care and counsel also among others and from others, our Lord comes, comes in his word, comes in his sacraments, reminds us that when he called us to himself in baptism, he put his name on us and he promised You may walk away from me, but I'm never walking and turning my back on you. And so when when we take our doubts to him, he is there. He answers. And we receive that person of the living Christ again. The good news is our Lord comes to Thomas and to all of us doubters. Next time the disciples were together, Jesus came and he addressed Thomas. Put your fingers here. Test my side. Do not be disbelieving, but believe. And through the doubts and through the questions in our lives, there comes finally that calm. Yeah. Some of you have heard me say this before, possibly in a Bible class, but there was a time in my life when this gospel spoke very, very closely. When I was at senior college here, and for you to understand Concordia Senior College and Junior College, you have to have hair the color of mine. But way back when, our synod had a senior college where Indiana Tech is now, and a, pardon me, a junior college. And then the senior college opened on the campus of what is now Concordia Theological Seminary. In my senior year of college, right after Christmas, my mom died. After the funeral, I came back. And one thing I did not want to do was to go to chapel. But by that time, they had, if you've been on the campus, they've got this big, they call it Campanile, next to the A-frame chapel. By that time, the bell had been installed. My dorm was two dorms behind the chapel. And in the morning, that I came to know it as the, to speak of it to myself, as the infernal bell rang 10 minutes. I don't remember going the first morning. By the second, I couldn't stop. This was January. By the time I went home for Easter, the Easter hymns spoke. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. So he comes to us, to Thomas and all of us doubters. And Thomas responded, my Lord and my God, my Lord, exclaiming the very thing that the other disciples had told him the previous week. We have seen the Lord, my Lord and my God, going back to an affirmation of what Jesus had said to his disciples in Thomas, to Philip in the presence of the disciples and Thomas, when he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. His grace, his peace, and his love. God, the Father's love, are present in that Lord. And as we have gathered today and heard his word again, and as we come often to this table, and he 
gives us his living presence with the body and blood, with his body and blood, we rejoice. Doubts finally mature to faith as our Lord continues to speak to us and we remain with the word and with one another. Yes, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. May that peace of Christ that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We speak of that Christ and of our Lord and, and God in the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand as we confess together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As you brought your offerings or will and bring them, leave them in the plate in the back or are, are giving online, for this time we receive uh, music and meditate on what we just heard.
enter into a time of prayer. And we know that uh, God answers prayers in miraculous ways. And so after worship, if you have uh, a need uh, that you'd like lifted up in prayer, we have um, our God Answers Prayers team that would be in the back of the sanctuary. Or if you're online and you fill out our attendance form and put a prayer in there, we'll, we'll give that prayer request to them as well as our staff will pray over that. Um, before we get there, though, I invite you to stand as we lift up the prayers of the church. As I say each petition, I'll end with, Lord, hear our prayer. I invite you to respond as we encounter the risen Jesus. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you are the creator of all things, and in your creation you graciously provide for us. We give you thanks for showing us your love and stories of people who encountered the risen Jesus. Lord, hear our prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you have given St. Michael many blessings, and we ask that you continue to bless our congregation as we search for our next senior pastor. Give our call committee listening ears and discerning hearts as they seek your will. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the great physician of body and soul. Show your compassion and have mercy on those who are sick, anxious, depressed, distressed, and facing any need. We ask that you would be with Judy Bostwick, Janice Peckrell, and Nancy Cooker as they continue to heal. And be with all those on our hearts who are facing any need. Show your grace and mercy to all who have needs at this time. Lord, hear our prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, give your comfort and presence to all the families in our community that are mourning the death of a loved one. We especially remember Elaine Mackey's family today. Bring peace and rest as only you are able in times of grief. Lord, hear our prayer. <laughs> all these things and whatever else you know we need, Grant us, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Taught by Jesus, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.